Hello and welcome. My name is Margot, and today we're talking about difficult conversations about treating pain. I'm here with Quinn No. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And could you tell them a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, as Margot said, my name is Quinn No. I am a licensed clinical psychologist and researcher. And so my primary area of research has been alcohol and drug use, as well as intimate partner violence. And I have also done a number of trainings for prescribers around prescription opioid use and treatment of pain. Great. Thank you. So what topics are difficult to talk about with patients? So for patients who are experiencing pain, the challenge is often that they've had experiences where they may not have been believed, either by family members or care providers, particularly for people who have experienced chronic pain. And so working with um, individuals who are in treatment for pain um, it's really about acknowledging their experiences and making sure that they understand that you believe them and that you know that that you're there for them that you care about what happens to them yeah so some of the challenging conversations can happen when they may be using um, pain medications not necessarily in the way that the prescriber intended. Uh, sometimes patients don't even know that they're doing that, um, but having conversations around proper usage, around how they're using it, when they're using it, they can be challenging for someone who's experiencing pain and just trying to find relief from that pain. Yeah, absolutely. How are motivational interviewing techniques and other strategies used to manage difficult conversations with patients? So motivational interviewing is um, an approach and a technique that really starts from respecting the patient. Mm -hmm. So historically, when we've talked about drug use and um, individuals who are struggling with addiction or just with any kind of alcohol or, or, or drug dependencies, um, it's been a very punitive approach. It's been sort of a you know, you have a moral failing, there's something wrong with you type of approach. Mm -hmm. And motivation, and it hasn't worked. It hasn't been effective um, for individuals struggling with substance use or their families and friends. And so motivational interviewing is an approach now that we use that really um, treats the individual as a human being mm -hmm. who is struggling and suffering just like any of us. So some of the important components of motivational interviewing that really makes it work well is that um, the assumption isn't that the person who is, you know, the, the quote unquote expert um, is an actual expert in the patient's lives. Mm -hmm. So the patients are the experts in their own lives. And motivational interviewing acknowledges that. Also through motivational interviewing, it's a process of understanding an individual's motives um, why they may or may not do something, and what goals and hopes and dreams they have for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's about helping patients identify what's important to them. Are their current behaviors and what they're doing helping them get to those goals? Mm -hmm. And if they aren't, how can we help them get there? So it's a really wonderful framework to use. There are also approaches um, such as cognitive behavioral therapy um, and cognitive behavioral skills that can help individuals to learn very specific skills and problem-solving approaches. Um, for instance, if they're experiencing pain and they've um, and it's not time for them to take their ne next dose of pain medication, what can they do instead? What are their options? Um, and some of the approaches that have been used also include um, mindfulness-based or mind-body approaches. Mm -hmm. um, so yoga has been a wonderful approach. Um, tai Chi is also a wonderful approach. And mindfulness and meditation, those approaches won't make their pain go away. Yeah. But it helps them to deal with their pain. It gives them something else that is good for their body and for their mind, something that they can do to help alleviate some of the pain that they're experiencing. So those are all approaches that can be used um, when working with patients who are, um, who are being treated for pain. Yeah, that's very interesting. So how do you start those conversations with patients? So this is a great time to apply motivational interviewing uh, principles. And really when you're starting a conversation, if, if you have a client that you're concerned about, either because their pain isn't being managed well, they may not be using their medication enough or maybe too much, um, starting those conversations from really a place of understanding and non-judgment. So 
asking your client how he or she is doing, what things are working right now, what things aren't working now, and really asking in a way that shows that you really care. There has to be something about this person that you really care about and you're concerned as a professional about their well-being. And being able to convey that um, is really about connection and it can be the single most important thing that you convey to the client that you're working with. So first that you care and then getting a sense of what's working, what's not working. And then talking about your concern. I'm a little concerned about X, Y, or Z that I saw um, or that you've mentioned uh, several times, you know, that this is happening or this isn't working. Um, And so really bringing your client in as the expert in what's working and what's not working. And then having conversations around possible transitions in in medication that they might want to talk to their um, prescribers about or having conversations about how they're using it or your concerns around your use again, really coming from a place of concern and non-judgment. So if one of your clients says, yeah, I'm taking my pain medications probably more often, like I'm not supposed to take it um, more than, you know, six hours apart Mm -hmm. um, or or less than six hours apart. Um, But I'm really only going four or five hours before I take it again. Mm -hmm. Um, Then you have to be very careful not to, you know, have the surprise face, which can be hard when you're in with a client and they're saying, oh, they're taking their pain medication, you know, every three or four hours when they shouldn't be. Um, But being very, you know, present with yourself Mm -hmm. and knowing that if you have a surprised face, your client's going to see that. Mm -hmm. And so being really careful and just saying, okay, um, so you're taking it more frequently than is prescribed. And that's a concern because if you, if you are taking it more frequently, um, then there are these things that could happen or these sets of risks. And so I really want to make sure that you're being that your pain is being treated well and that you um, as a whole entire person are doing well. Um, Because of these concerns, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the the course of pain treatment and maybe how we can help manage this a little bit better for you. So again, really thinking about, you know, having understanding and non-judgment for this person. And sometimes that can be hard. Sometimes as providers, we're tired. We've seen client after client and we are sort of at our wits end. Or we have a client that just never listens to us. Mm -hmm. That no matter what we say, that person is going to go and do whatever they want. And so there can be a level of frustration. And just understanding that as frustrated and, and difficult a time as we're having, our client is too. Yeah. And as professionals, we really need to be the ones to set our frustration aside, deal with that outside of this interaction with the client and be there for our client. Um, because even though we may not feel like we're making a difference, we are. When we have repeated positive interactions with our clients, it can make a real difference and people will remember that. And it may take time for people to change their behaviors, um, but those changes can happen. Part of the key um, aspects of motivational interviewing is that you're never trying to tell someone what they need to do or what they're doing wrong. It's really about eliciting information from them, um, really about sharing information with their permission, um, and letting them make the decisions for themselves. Because we as care providers are not going to be able to force anyone to do anything. This is something that your client has to come to on their own. And so being there to help guide that, um, again, with the idea that this is so they can meet their goals, so they can achieve what they want. Yeah, awesome. So as a non-prescriber, what do you do if you don't agree with the prescriber's recommendation? That's a great question. Um, A lot of times we, we may disagree with Um, our fellow professionals about their treatment plan. Um, I think first and foremost, um, as a care provider, uh, it's important to assess whether this is, you know, in an imminent danger to your client. So is this something that is going to affect their health? Is this something that's putting them at risk? So that is the first thing to assess. And every field has a different way of doing this. Um, Every, um, 
office may have a different approach to this. And so really understanding what is that process, um, both in your field and also where you're working. Um, so first assessing what is the risk? Is it long term? Is it short term? Is this immediate? Um, and understanding where that is. Um, and then really knowing what is the process um, for communicating this with the prescriber, what is the process for collaborative care, um, and really trying to work through your office to talk about this. Um, there are some providers that will collaborate better than others. Mm -hmm. And so really having a plan in place. Who are your supports where you work so that if you're going into this conversation, someone else knows about it, someone else understands what your approach is, what your concerns are, and someone else can help support you through that process. Um, and, and documenting everything, making sure that you write down the concerns that you have, mm -hmm. the risks that you think there may be, and also the steps that you've taken to um, work with the prescriber. Um, I think it's also very important to um, approach the prescriber um, with the idea that they are doing the best they can and that they have the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. I think with the opioid crisis that we have now, a lot of the blame has been directed towards prescribers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and that makes it really difficult for a group of people who really went into a profession of care providing and, and, and wanting to help their patients. And so not going into the situation assuming that, um, you know, the prescriber is incompetent or, uh, you know, or ha uh, malintended, you know, I think is really important. And so raising questions in a very neutral, collaborative way, mm -hmm. talking about how can I help you support your work as, as a prescriber, this is what I'm doing to help your patient as well, and how do we work together? Yeah, that's great. What makes for a successful collaboration across the continuum of care? Um, another excellent question. I think the most important thing is really respect across disciplines. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes we're in our silos. We don't always know what another discipline does and not making assumptions about what the other care providers do. Um, so I think uh, on our end, it's really making sure that we understand what role each um, collaborative care team member has. Um, and then as a collaborator, it's making sure that we clearly communicate what we do, what we can or cannot do, um, what we are equipped to do and what we're not equipped to do. Um, we're all very busy professionals, so I think having maybe a one to two sentence description of here's my role, here's what I do, and being able to provide that for other people on the collaborative care team is really helpful. Um, and I think also, again, coming from a place where we're all making the assumption that everyone's doing the best they can, that everyone is providing the best care that they think the, the, the client needs. Um, communicating very respectfully and also communicating when things change. There may be something that a client tells their physical therapist that they're not telling their mental health professional or they're not telling their prescriber. Mm -hmm. And so being able to communicate to the, in the entire team when something comes up, oh, you know, Mrs. Jones is no longer in her home. She's actually, you know, in... Um, in an assistant living assistant living um, facility now, mm -hmm. or this person is actually homeless now, or this person has is dealing with a great deal of food insecurity. Mm -hmm. um, any information like that is going to be relevant to treating pain and having everybody know what's going on will also help alleviate some frustration. So why does so and so not show up for their appointments with mm -hmm. me. Well, it's because they weren't able to make their car payments and they've lost their car. And I think understanding where our clients are coming from helps us to be more compassionate and we can help each other be more compassionate by sharing this key information across the collaborative care team. Yeah. So just making sure everybody's on the same page. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your expertise. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. Of course. And thank you for watching.
Difficult Conversations We all know that conversations with patients who are taking opioids long-term for chronic pain can sometimes be challenging. Here are some principles to guide those conversations developed by clinical experts in the field and some vignettes of these sometimes difficult conversations. As you watch these vignettes, keep these principles in mind. Keep the primary focus on outcomes patients care about. Redirect the conversation to focus on what patients can do to improve their quality of life. When discussing risk, focus on the drugs and the harm and side effects opioids can cause. Avoid backing the patient into a corner and use shared decision-making to address patient concerns. Be your patient's ally by expressing empathy and support for their concerns and uncertainties. Hi, Viv. How are you today? I'm terrible. I'm so tired of this pain. Mm, sorry. Tell me a little bit more about what's going on. Well, I'm in pain. I don't sleep at night. I can't exercise or do anything. So pain is bad. Sleep is bad. Tell me about a typical day for you. Well, I go to bed at night and then I toss and turn the entire night. I get up in the morning. My husband leaves for work. I sit down for a second and I fall back asleep because I'm so tired from the night before. In the afternoon, I might get on the computer or try to start dinner. I'll be standing at the stove, but I'm in so much pain that I can't, I can't even stand there. What do you do after dinner? Watch TV, maybe get on the computer again mm -hmm. until it's bedtime and then I go back to bed, but I'm not sleeping. I just toss and turn. Difficult Conversations I'm not going to walk when I'm in pain and then it just makes the pain worse. Okay. Or I'm too tired to walk and I can't even keep my eyes open. Mm -hmm. oh. So it sounds like really think this is not working. No. You're not doing well. No, and my husband's to the point where he's ultimately frustrated at me because of the pain. We can't go anywhere or we can't go out at night. We're supposed to travel to our family reunion out of state next summer. That's not going to happen. Not if I'm in this kind of pain. Pain. I think we really need to make a change. We need to change what we're doing. What do you mean? Well, I think we need to focus on getting your life back and getting you into the things you want to be doing. Like, what kind of changes though? What's, what's, what are you going to offer me that's different? All right. Well, if you were going to go to that family reunion, what would need to be different? What would you need to be able to do to go? Well, I would be, need to be out of pain, which I don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, kind I of functionally, what would stand, you need to do? Yeah. Stand on my feet, mm -hmm. walk for distance, travel, whether it's car or plane. How far would you have to walk to go? Hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, at least be able to stand on my feet for 20 minutes okay. or so, let's mm -hmm. say. And I watch my niece and nephew when I'm there. I can't even do that. My sister's afraid that I'm going to sleep on the job. All right. So we have to really improve your endurance so you can stand, so you can walk and keep up with people, and so you can be awake during normal hours when everyone else is awake. Is that right? Yes. I mean, those are good goals, and that's what I want to focus working on. And to get there, I think we do need to make some changes to your medicines, too. Wait a minute. I'm not just going to not get on pain, be on pain meds anymore. No, you're not. You're right. I think we're not going to just stop your pain meds, but I think what we need to do is change your pain meds, start backing off slowly. I think all you're getting with this current high dose is side effects. So what do you suggest? Well, I suggest making just one small change at a time. One little change. Baby steps. Well, just remember, I mean, last year I was miserable in the pain program. They mm -hmm. cut me off so quickly, I went into major withdrawals. Yeah, and I don't want to do it that way. We know that didn't work for you. Just like we know the current plan's not working, 
So what I think I want to do is something much more gentle. So one baby step at a time. You're taking 60 milligrams of morphine three times a day. Yep. I just want to cut back one pill a day so that one of those doses is 45 milligrams. It's a small change. So basically, I don't really have a choice. We're going to cut my regimen down. We need to cut your regimen down because this isn't working. It's just causing you trouble. You're not doing well. You just told me that. Okay. But you have choices about how we do it. And okay. we can do it at the speed that's comfortable for you. We'll reevaluate and we'll make a new plan if it's not working. So one time a day. Yep. So we could change it so it's 45 milligrams in the morning or in the afternoon or the evening. Um, well, I've got a, I would say the afternoon. I think it's okay. important to have it in the morning to get going. Okay. But I definitely don't want to go fast. Okay. Well, we could go down as fast as once a week. No. Okay. No. All right. I could probably maybe try once a month at the most. Well, I'll write the prescription this time for 60, 45, 60. Mm -hmm. We'll reevaluate in one month. And okay. we'll decide if you're ready to make a change. I'm going to have my nurse, Carol, give you a call in a week. And now let's just talk about your exercise goals. We hope these vignettes and principles will be helpful when you encounter these difficult conversations with your patients. Thank you for your time. All right, so having the conversation